but as a global progress toward achieving the UN's sustainable development goal. So uh, joining with us today, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Paul, uh, excellent speaker uh, from the University of Tokyo, Professor Katayama Sensei, and Dr. Eric, uh, Director of Center for Sustainability Governance from IGES, uh, Dr. Kumara, uh, Deputy Director from the UNEP Center uh, for uh, Environmental Technology, also by in uh, IGES, and also Dr. Nguyen Thị Linh Dan, Nguyen Linh Dan uh, the Faculty of Environmental Climate Change and Urban Study from the National Economic University in Vietnam. So uh, before inviting the keynote speaker uh, to speak uh, in, in our session, uh, please uh, allow me to spend a few minutes uh, to uh, share with you some background about the sessions and also um, to give you some idea uh, what, what, what are the potential or what are the existing impact that COVID pandemic is now having uh, on our, um, our, our work, especially in the field of environmental. So as you know that um, just yesterday, I, I just checked uh, one of the most uh, reliable sort of information on the global impacts uh, on the COVID uh, from the John Hopkins uh, USD. And we found that uh, up to yesterday, it's already more than 60 million cases of COVID infection has been confirmed around the world. And uh, it's uh, caused the death of more than 1.4 million people. And unfortunately in Asia, more than 30% of, uh, of the global infected case is from Asia and uh, more than 20% of them is, uh, more than 20% of the global deaths is also coming from Asia. So, um, so it's, it's the, the COVID impact has, uh, the COVID has a lot of impact to every aspect of our life, our human life, also in every corner around the world. Uh, this also creates a kind of uh, challenge to the, the global uh, commission, the commitment to toward the sustainable development by the year 2030. Uh, as some of you may know that uh, in uh, 2015, uh, more than um, 150 uh, countries around the world gathering, gathering at the uh, UN's uh, Sustainable Development Summit and uh, adopt uh, 2020 agenda for sustainable development. We consider 17 goal. Uh, it's so a kind of uh, global uh, commitment toward the achieving the sustainable development by the year uh, 2030. So the SDGs uh, call for a kind of uh, collective actions by all the country, no matter developed country, developing country or poor country, you know, to promote the pro prosperity while protecting the planet. And more important, the SDGs provide a very critical framework for the COVID-19 uh, response, recovery, and redesign. And actually in Vietnam, the government of Vietnam also uh, approved the national action plan for implementations of uh, 2030 sustainable development goal agenda in 2017. It's setting a, a, a national goal and target to shape the ways uh, for the future, for the country future by the year 2030. And let's give you some kind of very quick look uh, how the COVID uh, is now impact uh, on, on a variety of the global SDGs. Uh, this is by on the, the latest report, uh, which has been launched by uh, UN very recently uh, on to show how the COVID implications on various uh, aspects of our life. For example, in terms of the SDG goal number one is on uh, poverty. The COVID already caused uh, the first time in ever Cause some kind of um, uh, increase in, 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 in increase in the in the uh, in the poverty. So it means that uh, the world will, will be off track uh, to end the poverty by the year 2030 because of the COVID. In addition to that, it also creates some challenge on effect on the food security and uh, also especially on the public health. So it's, it it reverses the uh, 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 the uh, decays of improvement in the public health. Uh, thanks to the efforts from the many country. And also um, it's got a lot of impact to the e education as well. Like uh, many schools around the world have to close because of the COVID. So students cannot come to school. And um, also another issue about the gender issue, uh, 
um, the COVID uh, or the lockdown because of COVID also increased the risk of the violence uh, against women and girls, uh, especially during the lockdown. And you can see that uh, there's recently, there's now many newspapers said that uh, uh, after the COVID, the number of uh, deposits case has increased significantly uh, just because of uh, possibility because of some kind of violations in the family, in the household. And also, especially the COVID also have a lot of impact um, on the water qualities and sanitation and also so on. Just give you some uh, idea. For example, uh, recently, so many uh, scientists around the world has already detected the, the COVID in the human feces, in the domestic, as well as in the hospital wastewater. And unfortunately, in, in ASEAN, especially in Asia, uh, because of the lack of the wastewater treatment facility, so most of the uh, most of the COVID, uh, I mean, most of the wastewater from the household just go directly to the river or lakes. So it creates a lot of a huge potential for the infection if uh, if uh, um, uh, property uh, if uh, properly action are not uh, has not been taken. Uh, so similarly, we can found that uh, there's so many uh, detections of the COVID not only in the in the wastewater but also in the river in the wet water treatment plant and also in Asia where there's a lot of flooding. So the over, overflow from the sea system also um, mixed with the rainwater and also cause some kind of potential risk uh, for the people in the flooding area, especially during the flooding event. And also the issue of the medical waste, the issue of the hospital waste uh, has not been uh, properly addressed, uh, especially in uh, Asia country. Uh, so in terms of the economics, uh, the COVID also creates a type of the world's uh, economic uh, regressions around the world, not, not, not on specific country, but at the global scale. And um, COVID mostly is uh, happened in, the, in uh, the density area, like in the urban area, you can see it here, right? And also, uh, however, the COVID already creates some, a lot of impact, negative impact to the society. But uh, again, we can see some kind of positive impact it may bring uh, for example, uh, many scientists found that the, the amount of greenhouse gas emission has been uh, quite significantly uh, dropped uh, during the year 2020. And also the COVID uh, also give us uh, some kind of lessons uh, that uh, we, we have to look back the way we are now treating the nature, the way we are now consuming the, the resort and how to use the resort. We need to think how to make it more sustainable. So I think uh, the, the SDG uh, we create a, a kind of a very critical framework uh, for us uh, to address this kind of, or this issue. So um, uh, it's my pleasure again to uh, introduce you um, uh, many excellent uh, expert uh, speaker today uh, who will give us more insightful about the, how how the COVID will impacts on variety of aspects, for example, wastewater, medical waste. Um, and also the global progress uh, on SDG in general. Uh, so that's uh, all from my uh, talk uh, for the pre framing presentation. Now, please allow me to invite the uh, first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Eric. Uh, Eric is a director of the uh, Center for Sustainability and Governance uh, from the IGES. Um, so he have a lot of experience uh, uh, working in the field of the SDG. So he will give you a very insightful understanding how the COVID uh, will impact on the global progress on the SDG, as well as uh, the potential framework for addressing uh, this challenge. Yeah, Eric Sang, please. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Bao San, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, if it's okay, I'd like to uh, start uh, sharing my screen so I can uh, do the presentation. Okay, can everybody see the slides? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to be presenting uh, a little bit uh, on this um, on framework that uh, colleagues at uh, our Institute for uh, Global Environmental Strategies have developed. Uh, we call the Triple R Framework, um, and uh, this is uh, focusing a lot on uh, how we can ensure that uh, we move on uh, sustainable development trajectory uh, in the wake of uh, COVID. So. 
Um, as you can see, this is uh, actually the effort based upon the efforts of uh, many other colleagues. Um, and uh, I will uh, break the presentation up into a few different sections. So I'll start briefly. Um, you'll hold on for a second. Unfortunately, what happens when you're on an international <laughs> uh, uh, call sometimes, uh, sometimes you get some phone calls. Okay, so at any rate, um, I'll start off by talking about uh, uh, the COVID impacts and then go to a discussion of shocks, barriers, and policy coherence. Then I'll introduce uh, this triple uh, R framework and apply it uh, to uh, particular cases and then uh, just come out with a few discussion questions and key points. So first of all, I'd like to highlight, as Baosan has already mentioned, the impacts of COVID have been uh, massive. Uh, the clearest impacts, of course, are in terms of uh, what we've seen in loss of lives uh, and also health impacts. But as Baosan also mentioned, there are many other impacts on uh, the different uh, sustainable development goals so this uh, diagram right here demonstrates how COVID is uh, bound up with uh, uh, all 17 of the different uh, SDGs. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, having impacts on uh, sustainable cities and communities in terms of uh, the um, exposure to uh, um, uh, different types of uh, risks. Um, but also creating opportunities in some cases. And I'll talk a little bit about those opportunities in just a second. Um, and one of the key sets of impacts, of course, have been on the environment. So at our institute, we have uh, teams that focus on uh, waste management. So my colleague uh, Kumarasan will speak a, a lot on the waste management issue. Uh, but we've seen, uh, for instance, um, uh, increased uh, amounts of uh, disposable equipment and single-use plastics in some areas. Um, we've also seen impacts on air pollution, which I'll talk about in a little bit greater detail. Um, and in this case, uh, we've seen that uh, exposure to air pollution may actually worsen some of the impacts of uh, COVID acting much like an underlying condition. But at the same time, uh, some of the shutdown and lockdown activities have led to uh, reductions in air pollution, especially in heavily polluted areas. So there's been sort of a mixed bag there. And as Baosan also mentioned, we've seen impacts on water and wastewater, um, as well as uh, sustainable uh, lifestyles and uh, livelihoods. Um, and I think in each of these areas, as I suggested, we can see uh, both uh, impacts uh, that are uh, negative, but also some uh, opportunities. And now what I'd like to do is to try to put us in the frame of thinking a little bit about these opportunities. And to do that, I'd like to start with this quote from a Nobel laureate, Paul Romer, who's an economist at Stanford University. And uh, one of the things that he highlights is that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And uh, what he's referring to is a lot of times when we have some type of um, external or sometimes we call exogenous shock, um, to the, the way that we uh, manage um, certain problems, uh, and especially when we have a shock to our public policy systems or institutions, um, this can create an, an opportunity to change the direction and the way that those systems work or the way that our institutions structure and, and uh, make decisions about uh, certain problems. And part of the reason this shock can be so powerful is a lot of times when we want to change the, the nature of the way those systems work or the way that our public policy institutions work, um, it's very difficult. There's uh, several different barriers. Some of them are technological in nature. Some of them are financial in nature. Some of them are institutional in nature. And many a times these different barriers work together. They're sort of mutually reinforcing um, and create a situation where they lock us into a certain type of, in this case, uh, development pattern. And what I would suggest to you is one of the challenges that we faced when it comes to the SDGs uh, more generally is that we've been locked into a situation where uh, 
basically been a relatively unsustainable uh, development patterns. And, and this varies across different countries, of course, but I would say on average, it's been very difficult for us to change the way that our public policy systems work um, so that we would place greater emphasis on environment. And so this endogenous shock, when it comes from sort of outside of the system, it breaks down a lot of these barriers, it creates opportunities for new institutions to emerge and new interests to push forward. Um, in this case, uh, some of the objectives that are under the sustainable development goals. Now, what we try to do, and I just then is think about, okay, we have this exogenous shock. We have many of these barriers that are making it difficult to move on to a more sustainable development trajectory. Um, but how do we take advantage of this quote unquote window of opportunity? How do we take advantage of this crisis? And what I would suggest to you is it's important to have the shock, of course, but the shock in and of itself may be necessary to change the nature of our development, but it's not sufficient. And in order to actually take advantage and keep that window of opportunity open, what I would suggest is we need a coherent framework to organize the different decisions that governments are making on or related to COVID. And unfortunately, I think what we've seen when it comes to the environment is despite some of the opportunities I mentioned previously, and also some of the threats, uh, many of the government related COVID plans and policies are rather piecemeal. Um, they're not very coherent and they're also very short sighted. Um, there's not strong consistency from one element to another and there's not a lot of long term thinking that's going into it. And so what we're suggesting many of our colleagues at I just are suggesting is this triple R framework where we think about the response, the recovery, and then the redesign um, is going to be important if we're going to take advantage of this window of opportunity, this external shock. And I just want to highlight what I mean a little bit more concretely by this evidence of uh, by, by incoherence or short-sightedness. So one of the clearest pieces of evidence comes from some work that uh, some of my colleagues are doing at IGES. And this is looking at the stimulus packages. So I think many of us are aware that governments have put a lot of money into trying to jumpstart economies uh, during and after COVID. Um, and what my colleagues have looked at is not only the amount of money that governments have put into this, but the extent to which that money is going to uh, quote unquote, clean or sustainable uh, uh, pursuits, or in this case, uh, fossil fuels and, and uh, dirty uh, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, energy intensive uh, uh, programs and, and activities. And what we can see here, this is a list of the G20 countries, and you can see the different stimulus packages broken up by the emphasis on the sort of dirty or uh, fossil fuel investments uh, versus the, the green ones, the, the cleaner ones. Um, and you can see pretty much across the board that there's at least about 50% of these resources are going into things that are not so sustainable. And of course, this varies from one country to another. But this suggests that there's a lot of incoherence uh, in the stimulus packages. And I'll just give you another example from, uh, I mean, the country that I come from, the United States. So the big stimulus package in the United States is under what's called this uh, CARES legislation. And if we look closely at this CARES legislation, what we'll see is that there are some provisions that uh, provide, for instance, tax relief uh, for uh, renewable energy projects. But there's also a lot of provisions that provide uh, loopholes for fossil fuel industries um, and also rollbacks on environmental regulations. I mean, this is done in the name of trying to once again restart the economy, but it goes against um, many of the ideas that are put forward in the SDGs and it will not lead to this uh, significant deviation from the business as usual development that I had showed previously. So what I'm suggesting then is in order to take advantage of this exogenous shock, in the case COVID, um, what we really need to do is have a coherent and co co consistent framework for organizing our decisions. And that coherent and consistent framework is gonna consist of three different building blocks, what we're calling response, recovery, and redesign. 
And what I'm showing here in this diagram, I mean, I know it looks a, a little bit uh, too many arrows going on, but what I'm showing in this diagram is in order to keep this window of opportunity open and to really lead to a more sustainable development path that we need to bring this triple R framework into our decision-making. Um, and in order to do that, one of the ways that uh, we want to move forward, especially in, in IGES, is to not just okay, say we need to think of carefully about the response recovery and redesign, but take much of the science and uh, the data that we are um, uh, getting from uh, uh, our, our, our research and from some of the colleagues, you know, the, the, the more scientifically oriented work that's being done by this FANJIT conference and bring it into this framework. So the framework itself should be based upon science and it should be scientifically uh, uh, robust and evidence-based. And so the environmental impact should fit within this framework. Now then let me move to what I mean by triple R and what are each of these different R's uh, refer to. Okay, so the response, by response, we're thinking about targeted interventions to address immediate impacts of COVID. Um, and so, like I said previously, my colleague Kumar, I think will talk, for instance, about uh, the waste issue. And I know they've done a lot of great work on thinking about how to deal with the uh, increase in uh, uh, plastic waste. Uh, and some of the medical waste. Um, and so that's a relatively narrow intervention, but it has immediate impacts. Then the recovery here, we're thinking a lot about how the stimulus is gonna be allocated and also how to deal with potential rebounds in some of the um, uh, environmental improvements that we've seen. So for instance, I mentioned air pollution has gotten better in some places, but how do we make sure that um, uh, when the economy starts back up again, that we don't see a rebound in air pollution. Um, so that's the recovery. And then the re redesign is really thinking about systems. How do we change the different types of socioeconomic systems and our policymaking institutions to enable a more sustainable and equitable transition? So how do we bring new stakeholders into the decision-making process so that um, we can support some of the positive changes we're seeing with the initial response and with the recovery. And what I want to underline here is in order to make sure that we move a more sustainable track in line with the SDGs, we want to have good coherence and consistency between these three elements as well as within these three elements. Um, and in order to do that, just to show the sort of differences between these elements, so they differ in terms of their temporal outlook, okay, whether they're thinking near term, near to medium term or long term, the scale and scope of change they're trying to achieve, whether it's a narrow intervention, relatively broader intervention, or a more systemic intervention, um, and then the targeted stakeholders. And we gradually expand the stakeholders out from immediately affected groups to supportive government agencies and other supportive uh, or sympathetic groups. And then when we talk about redesign to try to bring in even a uh, broader cross-section of existing and newly empowered interests this includes business, civil society. Um, and uh, the idea here is we try to sort of grow the support for this um, push for a more sustainable future um, and then bring together these different elements of the response, recovery, and redesign. Okay, now I'm just gonna highlight one example of how this can be applied to the case of air pollution. Uh, we have a working paper on this that applies this triple uh, R framework to uh, waste management, as well as sustainable lifestyles, um, as well as um, uh, water management and wastewater management. But just to highlight in case of air pollution, so for instance, in terms of the response, we need to make sure we're responding to the crisis, make sure that we target communities that have poor air quality, because as I mentioned previously, uh, some of these communities are um, uh, suffering more from the impacts of COVID. We need to promote teleworking and non-motorized transport, once again, to deal with the immediate impacts. Now, the recovery for a low emissions future, once again, focusing on making sure we allocate stimulus to um, low carbon or low emissions policies and programs, um, and then also minimize rebounds, maintaining air quality improvements um, and also focusing a lot on what we call co-benefits, thinking about the linkages between air pollution, climate change, and health, 
and using those linkages in some ways to determine how we're going to allocate some of the stimulus. And then the um, redesign case is focusing a lot on systems and institutions again. And here we talk about strengthening atmospheric governance, enhancing coordination between different agencies that are responsible for air pollution, climate change, and health, um, reconsidering our infrastructure planning, because this is like institutions, the infrastructure will have long lasting impacts. And then also making sure that our institutions are responsive to marginalized stakeholders. So bringing in poorer communities, uh, once again, that might be more susceptible to the impacts of COVID. So this is just highlighting one possible application. I would underline that the actual application in different countries might vary a little bit. And I would also underline, as I'll suggest towards the end, that uh, while I'm doing this on a sort of sector by sectoral basis, part of the emphasis for having these, these three different categories is also to align across different sectors our, our actions. So that's one, the case of air pollution. And I just want to highlight this is a different from a business as usual, BAU stands for business as usual standard practice. So in a standard practice, of course, we see the response to the crisis is consisting of the lockdowns, social distancing, the testing and masks, and then reduced to air travel, public transportation. Um, the BAU case, once again, recovery for industries. So here we see their income support for fossil fuels, which I highlighted with some of the work that I showed on the stimulus packages. And then the redesign for future pandemics. Uh, here, there has been some effort to redesign institutions, but I would suggest to you a lot of times it's dealing more with the symptoms of the problem as opposed to some of its root causes and tends to be a little bit more at the end of the pipe as opposed to the source. So what we're suggesting is rather than follow this business as usual case to follow the case that I suggested for air pollution, and I'm not going to go into uh, so much detail here, but just to suggest that in our working paper on this, once again, we apply it to different policy areas. Um, and this just gives you a sense for flavor of the different applications. Um, and uh, I'll just let you look at that briefly just to underline that we contrast that once again with the business as usual. So this, in many ways, this uh, slide right here is the more detailed description of the applications. And it gives some substance to the, the difference between those uh, two lines that I was drawing, the business as usual and uh, the more sustainable trajectory that's aligned with the sustainable development goals. Okay, so let me um, conclude by uh, Let me um, conclude by suggesting some key messages. Well, COVID-19 is causing tremendous suffering and loss. It's also open opportunities for changing or reorienting our development paths. Um, in order to take advantage of this window of opportunities, policymakers need an integrative and coherent framework for organizing their different decisions related to COVID. Such a framework will lead the, the way to more transformative change, which is in line with the aspirations of the And then uh, last but not least, uh, we need to apply this framework to enhance uh, coordination and coherence within, not only within, but across multiple issues. And this integrated approach is also very much in line with the SDGs. So I will uh, stop there. And uh, I hope that uh, what I described here was uh, uh, understandable, especially to a uh, non-policy making uh, or policy research audience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Eric San, for your very um, informative information and, and very nice presentations on the triple uh, framework uh, to uh, address for the COVID uh, response, uh, recovery, and also redesign, and especially how the framework can be applied in. Um, in, for example, in the field of air pollution control and also climate change mitigation and so on. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to open floor for the question from the audience as well as from other speaker. Is there any questions from the audience and uh, other speaker? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If no one, so can I ask a question? Yeah, it's you pointed out that uh, the 3R is 
uh, very important for the sustainable development. Uh, but I just wonder uh, what is the the most difficulty to implement 3R for the uh, developing country where we have uh, very limited uh, skills, experience and resources, including human and also the financial. So uh, what is your, your suggestion for the developing country to implement the 3R? Okay, yeah, thank you um, so much, Dr. Vusant. And uh, I fully uh, understand the uh, point that you're raising. So um, let me let me make a, a few comments on this. Um, so first of all, I, I, I do agree. I mean, I think um, in a developing country context, the applications of this uh, uh, framework uh, might be uh, uh, different from uh, what you might see uh, in um, uh, developed country context. Um, and uh, also, I think uh, one of the bigger challenges, um, I would say both in developed and, and developing countries is, is especially the, the redesign element. I mean, I think that there's um, a lot of difficulties in uh, taking uh, systems and um, and changing the way that they work. Um, when, when I say systems here, I mean, for instance, the way that um, the Ministry of Environment uh, works with the, the Ministry of Finance, okay? Um, having said that, um, I think that there's uh, also a, a lot of opportunity here. I mean, I think um, what we're seeing is uh, that um, uh, even in a developing country context, uh, there's two things that are happening. I mean, I think one is that uh, there are uh, some developing countries that are uh, allocating uh, public resources uh, to try to uh, revive the economy. And so I think that that creates an opportunity. I think also we're seeing in terms of official development assistance, a lot of more resources now being uh, targeted, of course, on COVID and also uh, economic revitalization. So those two streams of revenue, I think uh, it's important that they go to, uh, to, to places that will be uh, potentially most sustainable. Um, and, uh, and then, I mean, in terms of, you know, where to target this, uh, I think, you know, one of the points that I wanna highlight in terms of the redesign is I think there's an important opportunity here for the ministries of environment to work more proactively and more constructively with the ministries of finance. Um, and to use things like the SDGs as a way to determine how those resources get allocated. Um, so I would suggest that the redesign in some ways is perhaps one of the most challenging aspects, both across developed and developing countries, that new funds are coming in both in developed and developing countries. And one of the key areas to target is to work, to try to uh, bridge sometimes the unhealthy divide between the ministries of environment um, and ministries of finance. It's a relatively high level, like answer to your question, I'm, I'm coming at it from a governance perspective. Uh, I think, you know, you might hear from other colleagues uh, some more on the ground type of interventions and I'll, I'll leave them to, to provide some of those on, on the ground suggestions. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric Sam. Any, is there any other question from the audience? Actually, I also have a small question uh, related to Dr. Kang. Um, I saw in your presentation, you mentioned a lot about the uh, economics uh, stimulus package uh, by developed country, uh, for example, US and other country. But when I reviewed uh, those uh, in developing country, uh, most of the economics uh, stimulus package is spent for supporting the busy sector or, or for the people and so on. Uh, not much about emphasize on the um, like energy sector and so on, uh, clean energy and so on. Um, of course, uh, there's many reasons behind this uh, decision uh, because of lack of uh, budgets and like, uh, some, some kind of other issue. But uh, in, in, in your opinions, uh, what could be the priority area that uh, those countries can consider as a priority area for applying the triple R framework? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks very much for that, uh, Baosan. So uh, um, I'm going to 
I, I like this question a lot and I'm gonna, so, I mean, some of the options I think Kumarasan will talk about a little bit in the context of uh, disposable waste, I think is, you know, something that's very concrete on the ground. And some of the options I think, you know, you could talk about uh, uh, wastewater management. Um, but in terms of air pollution, for instance, um, and uh, in the case of, let's just say, Southeast Asia, um, uh, one of the big causes of air pollution in Southeast Asia, I think, as we know, is uh, uh, indoor air pollution. So, I mean, I think a lot of the focus in, uh, with COVID has been on, um, on outdoor air pollution. But one of the things that we've seen is because of COVID and because of the lockdowns of economies, people are spending a lot more time indoors these days. Um, and what this has done is actually increased exposure to indoor air pollution. So one of the areas I think um, that can be targeted, uh, which has an environmental and health focus, of course, um, is in line with so, you know, what you're suggesting is you know, a lot of these resources are not going necessarily to big renewable energy projects, um, is to trying to uh, um, bring uh, clean cook stoves, um, and in some cases, you know, this is not necessarily just a financial problem. It's a capacity building problem. Um, it's an information sharing problem. So a lot of times it's also sort of software around some of these programs. Um, but uh, focusing on clean cooking, I think, could have, you know, huge impacts. We already know it'll have huge impacts and would be a very good place for resources to be uh, targeted, um, both in terms of finance, but also capacity building and, and, uh, and uh, related sort of software. Thank you very much, uh, Eric Sang. Uh, I absolutely agree with your um, advice and suggestions uh, on, on, the, on this. Um, so I also received one question uh, from the audience on the chat box. Uh, they like to ask about the win-win status of the triple bottom line. Win-win status? Yeah. The triple bottom line, yeah. Sure. Can you share it? <laughs> sure. Okay, so this is... Uh... I mean, uh, a little bit uh, in some ways related to the points I was raising, but um, uh, the triple bottom line, as far as I understand it, uh, is an approach commonly promoted uh, among the private sector, among businesses, which uh, suggests that uh, there should be a strong emphasis on um, achieving uh, environmental, uh, social, uh, as well as uh, economic uh, ends. Um, and, uh, uh, and in so doing that there would be, um, you know, mutually uh, beneficial relationship between those, those the, the economic, uh, social and, and uh, uh, environmental um, uh, dimensions. And so for instance, if I'm a company um, that uh, let's just say I uh, manufacture shoes uh, that, you know, by trying to reduce the amount of water that I use um, and making sure that uh, the people are paid a, a livable wage, um, that uh, also in so doing, my profits will increase. Um, so this will be good for the social aspects, environmental aspects, um, as well as uh, the uh, economic aspects. Um, and uh, this approach, I think, is approximately 20, maybe 25 years old or so. I think you know, it, it has got a lot of uptake uh, in uh, private sector. Um, and I think what we see now um, is a, sort of an advance of that. I mean, I think we see now uh, companies using a lot of, uh, they, you know, they call this uh, ESG. Um, so this is environmental, social, and uh, governance uh, uh, impacts to evaluate um, both their internal operations and also to try to bring in uh, resources from external investors. Um, so I think the, the answer to your question, the status is, I think the approach is relatively well accepted and has matured quite a bit, especially to bring in resources from uh, external investors. Now, just to tie this back a little bit to the triple R framework, I think that the common point here is that, um, you know, if, if we do things in a way where we truly try to um, achieve synergies between our uh, near-term, medium-term, and long-term goals, um, and across uh, our different uh, sectors, um, there, those synergies can uh, provide an engine for transformative change. I mean, so the shoe company that I was talking about that does this well, 
I mean, it, it could grow into uh, not just uh, you know a, a small shoe company, but uh, a large uh, shoe corporate corporation. Similarly, I mean, if we get the synergies right between these um, response, recovery, and redesign elements, um, this can provide an engine for the type of transformative change that we envisage when we talk about trying to achieve 17 of really aspirational goals by 2030. So uh, I hope that answers your question, but uh, it's a slightly different topic, but I try to tie it into some of the points that was raised. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eric. I hope uh, Dr. Eric respond is, uh, makes sense to your questions. Uh, would you like to have any further questions for Dr. Eric? I think they're saying thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, is there any other question for Dr. Eric from the audience and also from other speaker? If, if okay. not, but can I just make yeah. one last point before I close? Yes, that? yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, or actually two last points. So, the, I, I mean, I talked a little bit to Dr. Lusan and Dr. Bao about my presentation before we started. I guess the thing I want to highlight is. Uh, um, I know this conference has a very strong uh, focus on uh, um, more technical elements. Um, this triple R framework, I, I mean, the, I, perhaps I went into a little bit too much depth, but the part of the point really is, uh, you know, from a governance perspective or from um, I'm a political scientist by training, I mean, we, we think of uh, our world has uh, sort of built upon different structures and institutions that influence how we make decisions. Um, and that system in some ways parallels what we see in our natural systems. And so if we have some type of dramatic shock from outside, just like it can change our natural systems, it can also change our social systems. And the point is that in order to take advantage of that, we also from in sort of a, a researcher side or social science side, we need to have a framework in place that keeps that window of opportunity open so that um, we actually move our systems in a way that's, uh, in this case, more sustainable. So uh, I'm just trying to bring this a little bit more in line with the, some of the other um, uh, segments of this important conference. And the very last point is, uh, I apologize for the very beginning. My my uh, my mom called in on Skype, so I apologize for the, the initial uh, disruption, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric Sang, for your excellent presentation and uh, information. Uh, so one again, thank you very much. Uh, please allow me to move to the next uh, keynote speaker. Uh, may I introduce uh, Professor Kadavi Ma Sensei, uh, a very uh, well-known international expert in the field of uh, microbiology. So we can hear from him uh, how the COVID impacts uh, the wastewater sector and how we can turn this gap challenge into the opportunity. Yes, Professor Katema Sensei, yeah, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll share my slide. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see oh, it. Okay, so let me start my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be uh, keynote speaker in this session. And uh, actually, according to the program, the, I have only two or three minutes, but I will take longer time, probably. Um, uh, the, today, I will talk about wastewater epidemiology for novel coronavirus. And uh, my, uh, OK. This is my laboratory logo, and uh, this contains water and viruses. Uh, and uh, our, we are a specialist in this uh, list, uh, the field. And let me begin with uh, the movement in the international society on water. The, in the year of 1977, the United Nations already started to uh, commit uh, the, the, the water supply the all people, whatever their stage of development and social and economic condition, have the right to have access to drinking water in quantities and of a quality equal to their basic needs. So the United Nations commit 
uh, the water supply here in the year 1977. And uh, the recently, not very recent, but recently, uh, the United Nations also has the International Year of Fresh Water 2003. And uh, they again mentioned, but this time not only water, but also sanitation as well. No single measure would do more to reduce disease and save lives in the developing world than bringing safe water and adequate sanitation to all. So the sanitation becomes a key point here because uh, the disaster can bring the pathogens to the people through uh, lack of adequate sanitation. So uh, the United Nations noticed the problem of um, the pathogens or water uh, issues on public health. And uh, so, so the, along with the, uh, the statement in the fresh year, uh, that they started Millennium Development Goals. The uh, Millennium Development Goal is uh, uh, started before the Sustainable De Development Goals and this started to, from 2005 to 2015. And there were eight targets, but uh, among, among that, uh, the, there, are, there are one uh, target or goal that uh, the, by tw 2015, the proportion of the population without sustainable access to safe water, uh, safe drinking water and basic sanitation. So this means uh, we have to make the people half who lacks the access to the water and sanitation. And uh, when we started this one, so nobody think this target is possible to achieve. But actually, the, we succeeded in making half uh, the people who has lack of access to safe drinking water before the target year. But in case of the basic sanitation, we couldn't achieve the target to make the half, make the, peop, uh, the proportion to half. So this is uh, the, our, uh, the situation uh, before the starting of the SDGs. So United Nations uh, mentioned uh, the, declared the, sustainable development goals in the 2015 as a uh, success of uh, minimum development goals. And in the goal number six, we have water, clean water and sanitation. So the, there we, we facts, in the fact seat, uh, the WHO and UNICEF indicated that the three in 10 people lack access to safely managed drinking water service and six in 10 people lack access to safely managed sanitation facilities. And each day, nearly thousand children die due to preventable water and sanitation related diarrheal disease. So diarrhea is keyword here that uh, water and sanitation is connected to diarrhea and that's why water is important and sanitation is important in the uh, field of uh, public health. So uh, the, uh, I picked up some uh, key facts. Uh, diarrhea disease is the second leading cause of this under five years old. Or each year diarrhea kills uh, around 500,000 children and uh, significant proportion can be prevented through safe drinking water and adequation, adequate sanitation. And the diarrhea is a leading cause of malnutrition in children under five years old. So that diarrhea is a very important issue in the, uh, the public health, especially in the young children in developing countries and water and sanitation is a key uh, control, controlling uh, part. So this is another evidence by Professor uh, Hunter, Paul Hunter from the United, United Kingdom. And uh, this uh, bubble chart 
shows uh, infant mortality rate as y-axis and total unserved as x-axis. And total unserved means that if this is zero, which means 100% of the people get access to safe drinking water. And if it is 20, then 80% of people have access to the safe water, but 20% of the people has no uh, good access to safe drinking water. And this means uh, the, if we have access to the safe water, we have less infant mortality rate. So uh, the, the children under five years old can survive uh, longer than the, those who has lack of access. And also this shows some relation to the GDP. So the, if we have more GDP per capita, then we have more access to the safe water. But if we have lack, uh, less GDP, then we don't have enough access to the safe water. And then we have no, uh, we have less uh, survival ratio. And if we just uh, uh, look at Africa case only, but we have similar tendency as well. So that this is very strong connection and the lack of access to the water and uh, the infant mortality rate has a very close relation. And this is caused by diarrhea, which is uh, caused by uh, pathogenic uh, microorganisms. So this is the fate of pathogens in water. The pathogens are increasing in human intestine. So they are not increasing in the environment or in water. They are increasing in the intestine only and emitted as feces and included in the feces and diffuse and decrease. So they have natural die off in the environment. So their concentration will go down. However, the, in the feces, tremendous number of uh, pathogenic microorganisms will be emitted in the feces per day, for example. But if you take only one microorganism, you have, let's say, uh, the probability of 1% infection or less than 1% infection, or sometimes uh, more than 1% of infection. So the diffuse and decay is not sometimes enough. So we need to prevent uh, those transmission. So the pathogens can transmit via water and we are concerned about that. But if we have enough water, then we can wash hands and we can make uh, the surrounding clean. Or if we have clean water supply, then we can uh, the cut the pathway from water to mouth. Or if we boil the water or cook the food, then we can have the safe uh, food and water. So we are making uh, ourselves uh, more safe by doing this and also infrastructure, including water supply and sanitation. So uh, the, this is the situation of how we are uh, protecting ourselves in terms of uh, the preventing the infection of uh, enteric viruses. So this is our field. Uh, the microbiology is there and uh, public health sector is also concerned about pathogens in water, but also we are environmental engineer who is interested in the water supply and sanitation also has uh, the interest in the pathogens in the water. And PCR, maybe most of you know the PCR because of coronavirus, novel coronavirus. And the PCR is a detection method of coronavirus to uh, the genome or RNA of coronavirus can be detected by this method. And this method is actually a game changer in the uh, past. So before PCR, the only medical microbiologist or biologist can deal with viruses and they use culture method and 
they are concerned about how to, what kind of virus are you or is there. So that they are very much concerned about the identification of viruses. But after PCR, the identification is already done by this method so that we are no more interested in the identifying. And uh, from 1990s, we started to apply this method to the environmental samples, including water. And uh, we, environmental engineer, can uh, work on the viruses in water. And we have, we are engineers, so we need the quantitative data. So we are passing uh, more quantitative manner uh, so that uh, the Passing in water, uh, this research field uh, dramatically changed by uh, PCL. And now, the, this actually, my name is here, but uh, the, we also already published a levy paper on the progress in detection methods and prevalence of human enteric viruses in water. So the passing in water is in our hand already in terms of the quantitative uh, the research. So, and uh, this, now we are working on the SARS-CoV-2, novel coronavirus. And uh, this slide is uh, uh, the front page of the one uh, international conference, uh, the, which was held in the November 8th, uh, very recent. And my uh, students uh, presented this. Uh, uh, and. Uh, the, there, we used some surrogate virus as a test virus and uh, tested various type of concentration method and RNA extraction method and uh, the applied it to the con uh, PCR uh, detection and succeeded in detect the SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, uh, I will introduce some of the results. And before going to the results, uh, this is uh, uh, the what we, uh, the, the concept the, of the wastewater-based epidemiology. The, the, some of uh, the infected people emit uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the feces and uh, the consequently the viruses will be transported to this, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Then if we monitor the influence of uh, this water stream plant, then we may be able to monitor the, uh, the, the infection situation in the uh, service area. So that if we can monitor the virus in the sewer system, then we may be able to uh, know the number of peop uh, infected people before medical surveillance uh, can catch that phenomena. So the, we try to uh, the test the various methods and apply it. And uh, actually, the, we, as I said, we worked on the viruses and in the water so we can apply our method. But the problem is that the, our method is applicable to the SARS-CoV-2 or not. That's uh, the, the key question there. And uh, before starting our, um, the introducing our result, there was um, one review paper and the presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater has been reported already. And uh, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater can be used to monitor COVID-19 in the community and effective concentration method is needed for recovery. And surrogate coronavirus data help to predict survival of coronavirus COVID 2 and data on the infectivity of SARS COVID 2 in wastewater for risk assessment are limited. So, this is limitation. We cannot tell the risk of infection via water because uh, we can detect only RNA, but we are not detecting SARS COVID 2 or infectious SARS COVID 2. So, that we don't know if this is really the risk factor or not. Anyway, uh, the Another post, uh, the limitation or challenging is the virus emission by human in feces. So this is uh, uh, 
number of feces emitted. <coughs> and this gray dot is from stool. So the most of the case, people are not uh, the emitting the coronavirus in the feces. And the some very limited number of people will emit. This is the uh, uh, number of infected in, and uh, the, this is expected log 10 SARS-CoV-2 gene copies per day. So the, this is very narrow. So we have a small chance to have the high concentration of SARS-CoV-2 if only one infected guy is there. But if we have 10 uh, infection, p infected people, then we have more likely to have a good number. And if you have 100, then we surely have the very large number of uh, the coronavirus in the sewer. So the, if we have limited number of infections, then we may miss the uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the wastewater. And the challenge is that enveloped virus or non-enveloped virus. So actually, the, we are working on no, non-enveloped virus for a long time because those viruses are causing diarrheal uh, disease. For example, norovirus or other uh, enteric viruses, poliovirus even, uh, is the be belonging to this kind of uh, the viruses. But SARS-CoV-2 is coronavirus, which has envelope. Envelope is the lipid surrounding the, uh, the protein body of uh, viruses. And this lipid has, um, will have uh, probably the hydrophobic uh, the property and uh, interfere with uh, our virus concentration method. And this is uh, other example that uh, we tested uh, the koi herpes virus, which has lipid and we failed in recovering in a good manner. But uh, we, if we try poliovirus, then we have more uh, recovery in the, uh, yeah, our concentrate. So we need to test the concentration and uh, we tested three ty different types of concentration method and two different types of RNA extraction method. And we, all six uh, results we tested and uh, they try to uh, compare the recovery ratio. Recovery is how much we seeded in the test water and how much uh, recovered in the, uh, the test tube or PCR in the final PCR. And we used three different type of raw sewage and uh, the tested if that method is really the robust or not. And we found this method is rather robust and stable and uh, the good for five, six as well. So that we adopted this method to test the real wastewater in Japan. And uh, the, we have weekly sampling and the wastewater raw sewage is sent to our laboratory and uh, tested using the best method we uh, obtained there. And uh, that we uh, got some positive uh, from the, some of the wastewater in July. So the, we confirmed that uh, this our method, actually we used um, surrogate virus, but our method was really applicable to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and we didn't use SARS-CoV-2 in our lab for the testing uh, phase because the uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, use of SARS-CoV-2 is limited. So that we use this one uh, to only the real uh, sample test. Okay, so that this is a summary that the water is an important vehicle of pathogens and water and sanitation is connected to public health via pathogens. And PCR was a game changer in the field of pathogen in water. Wastewater-based epidemiology is useful tool to monitor COVID-19 in the community. And SARS-CoV-2 RNA was detected from wastewater in Japan. 
uh, that's it from me. And this is actually the TV uh, snapshot that uh, my my uh, uh, the our uh, the result uh, broadcasted in Japan. Yes, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Katayama Sensei, uh, for your very insightful uh, talk and also uh, very impressive uh, result uh, of the, using the PCR for the detections of the SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. Uh, because the time is limited, so may I invite uh, maybe one or two questions from the audience? Is there any question from the audience or from the other speaker for Professor Katayama Sensei? Sensei, can, can I have a question? Mm. Yeah, um, in your presentation, do you just uh, briefly show the result of the SARS-CoV-2 detection in the yeah, yeah. west of Japan, Japan? So I just wonder, do you find any interesting information or interesting the relation, relationship between the detection of the virus SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater and the number of infected uh, cases in the area that you collected wastewater? Yeah, the, uh, obviously we need the more infection to detect the SARS-CoV-2 in a stable manner. The, the, our positive result is ca came, uh, coming from uh, samples, which we have 1,000 infection per week in Tokyo. So that probably now we can detect SARS-CoV-2 if we take samples in Tokyo or some mm -hmm. other area as well. But uh, the, we, our detection was not stable. This means that we may miss the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater as well. Uh, so, so if we have 10 times more infection in the community, then uh, we are sure that we can stably detect like in European countries or US. Mm. But uh, now the, the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 seems to me a kind of the detection limit so that we cannot mm. say any quantitative things at the moment. Mm. So that we may be better to narrow down the target area. So not uh, such uh, wastewater trim plant, but to the monitoring the smaller community or dormitory or hospitals or the care houses or those things can be possible, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But still we need more um, the sampling and the system. So we cannot do that, yeah. Yeah, so may I have a, well, just uh, one question uh, related to Dr. Kang question as well. Uh, you know that in the, in developed country like in Japan, you have very good uh, wastewater treatment system. So this is one of the very effective um, barrier to stop the, to minimize the risk of the infection to the community from the wastewater. However, the situation in developing country, like even in Vietnam, uh, the, the percentage of the wastewater treatment is very small, very small, like only 10 or 12%. And the, uh, most of them just discharge directly into the lake and river and so on. So the potential is very huge. So what could be the, your suggestion how to break this gap, uh, how to minimize this gap uh, potential risk uh, of infection uh, from the wastewater, especially for the so people who work at the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. Mm, the, 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 the fundamental problem is maybe the willingness to pay mm -hmm. of the people mm -hmm. uh, the, for the wastewater treatment or wastewater management. But uh, this is. Uh, uh, the, not very closely related to the, your question, but the, uh, the, for the COVID co new novel coronavirus, probably uh, the disinfection does work, mm -hmm. but for other uh, enteric viruses, disinfection of wastewater is not so much recommended because uh, they have limited uh, the effectiveness. So the uh, the treatment is better. Uh, so that maybe we need to combine with uh, disaster management probably. Mm -hmm. So that in the normal uh, situation, uh, the of course the water environment does have uh, some impact from the untreated wastewater, but uh, mm -hmm. the, for the safety management, 
maybe disaster management is more important, I think. Right. Okay. Thank you, Sensei. So um, in essence, um, although Thai is very limited, but I, I just want to give priority for one question from the from the audience from chat box. Uh, we will yeah. receive uh, uh, the, the audience uh, the, uh, said that um, the COVID uh, has been uh, detected in the urine and feces from the patient. So there's he or her question is whether it can transmit, transmit through the fecal and oral transmission or not. Sensei, can you? Yeah. Uh, the, the basically, no. Why? <laughs> uh, because uh, co novel coronavirus is very weak in the acid. So the, the, if we just take small number of co coronavirus the, the, in the stomach, we can kill them. So that this is a very strong immune system. But uh, the, the, because they have a large number of coronavirus in the intestine, because probably the increased number of coronavirus in the throat or lung uh, can uh, the continuously uh, the introduced to the stomach and very small number of coronavirus passed through the intestine. And there, they can increase the number. Mm -hmm. And the, interestingly, the, if the, some epidemiological evidence says that if we have uh, some uh, the medicine to control the stomach to reduce the acid, then the people who infected to the coronavirus has less severe syndrome, mm -hmm. which means if the coronavirus has um, infection in the stomach, then our immune system became more active and uh, our the symptom became less severe. Mm -hmm. That is possible, but mm -hmm. no medical or the evidence was, yeah. is there. But the some, my, this is my speculation actually, the not, not really the established uh, opinion by the medical people, but the, the, if the infection in the stomach is there, then the total uh, body immune system becomes more, I mean, the reactive and strong. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank yeah. you, uh, Katerina Sensei. Yeah. Uh, because we are a little bit uh, behind the schedules, yeah. uh, although we have many, many questions. So please allow me to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. my talk. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So next, uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Kumora? Uh, Dr. Kumara is the deputy director uh, from the UNEP uh, Collaborating Center on the Environmental Technologies uh, from IGES. Uh, Dr. Kumara has already um, had a lot of experience, uh, more than 25 years experience working in the field of the, of the waste management. So uh, today's uh, Dr. Kumara, uh, Kumara will share with us a more insightful story, how the COVID uh, is impact to the waste sector. Uh, Dr. Kumara, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, thank you again for, for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, uh, event. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to be uh, with you today. So uh, as the uh, organizing committee asked me to talk about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its impact uh, towards uh, uh, waste and the chemical management. So uh, uh, this presentation is uh, myself and my colleagues uh, Rajiv uh, was uh, prepared uh, for this conference. So, I would like to briefly share, give an introduction to the subject and some findings what we're doing so far in the in this uh, subject and and some recommendation and the conclusion so as you see uh, my presentation is based on the recent uh, publication that uh, uh, our institute was uh, done with the unep as a quick uh, response uh, to the needs of the national and the local governments uh, uh, and we publish uh, waste management during the covid-19 pandemic so it's now in both English and the Japanese languages uh, and widely used by the uh, national and the local governments as some kind of a guide, guiding book for how to, how to make their waste management systems in this uh, pandemic situation. 
Actually, that was uh, based on two methodologies, so some quick uh, literature review and also the questionnaire survey we did with uh, 15 countries, including Asia, uh, Pacific, Africa, and the Latin America. And we try to analyze both policy and practices in managing uh, waste management in general, but given much uh, emphasis on the healthcare waste management uh, during the COVID-19. And at the same time, identifying some practices for immediate uh, response uh, using what my colleagues, uh, 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 Eric is explained like a three R. So looking at uh, how they, the countries and the cities can respond to this situation based on uh, uh, recovery and uh, redesign the systems. So I, I want to, because this session is mostly SDG, I want to give you a little bit uh, quick uh, snapshot of how SDG progress in the Asia Pacific region, because recently UNSCAP published its 2020 report uh, of the progress in achieving uh, SDG in Asia and the Pacific. So you can see my subject is mostly this sustainable consumption. Uh, it's, a, it's a goal 12. And where the uh, mostly waste and the, uh, the chemical are included, especially in 11.6 uh, target and the 12.3, 12.4 and 5, uh, are all we found there is no any there is no progress actually it is going backward in indonesia and the pacific so this is very clear in what the recent two publications came from the world bank and one in asia where uh, our our team also worked uh, in these two two reports identified uh, even though before covid-19 situation uh, waste management and the chemical management in, in in asia and the pacific and also globally in developing countries is mostly lacking. So it's mean their capacities in making waste management before the COVID-19 is, is weak. So that's make uh, uh, very understandable for us uh, when the COVID-19 came suddenly. So uh, the, the countries who have uh, less capacity, less resources and the less system in place have getting more vulnerable in dealing with the COVID-19 situation. So we found most of our cities, uh, developing countries, uh, get in panic in, in handling the situations because uh, the, the waste management was increased, particularly healthcare waste, increase in the situation. And at the same time, some type of waste, like uh, my colleague Eric mentioned, plastic, this kind of a waste, uh, uh, waste uh, getting uh, increased. But there are available uh, facilities and, uh, and the collection systems, uh, these are, are, are lacking. So then they had to find how to handle this uh, over uh, uh, estimated or the overcrowded uh, the demand in, in very uh, less resources and the less capacities. So uh, at the same time, we found very interesting thing like uh, quickly, almost uh, even the, uh, pandemic, there were a lot of uh, national policies and the local policies regulations to, to proper management of the waste, uh, including the healthcare waste. And when the pandemic came quickly, most countries and the cities came up with a lot of uh, uh, waste management guidelines, policies, and so on. But the issue is not making uh, these guideline policies uh, based on the developed country's experience or the need of the international demand, but how to implement them uh, in a more proper manner. That was we found the institution and also the uh, resources uh, in implementing these uh, uh, policies and the legislation and the guideline was very weak in, in, in the countries. And another one we found very interesting one is also the disparities between the urban and the rural and the urban and the peri-urban in, 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 in allocating the resources and, and allocating the infrastructure and uh, to, to, to handle the, the pandemic situations. Because this is a case, a case where we study in the Indonesia, you can see most of the the facilities as well as the resources were focuses on the Western Indonesia, especially Sumatra and Java regions. But when it's go to the Eastern Indonesia and the central part, uh, there, there were huge gap between this allocation of the resources and the allocation of the technologies to, to 
uh, infrastructure to manage the, the, the situation. So these areas is mostly getting vulnerable to, to handle the uh, waste management within this uh, pandemic situation. So then I would summarize uh, some of our findings like uh, my colleagues Eric's mentioned. So we look at how the cities and the national governments take uh, quickly to, to work on this uh, uh, to waste management subject in, in under the pandemic situation. So we found uh, they had to quickly respond to the situation. That is what we learned. Most cities and the governments are, are taking. So we found it's very important in the two areas. One is uh, ensuring the health and safety of measures to the uh, waste workers and also the, the staff who, who are already involved in these waste management systems. Uh, this is mostly, uh, we found this is, is not different between the developed or the developing countries. Even in Japan, we found that is one of the main uh, challenge uh, what the Ministry of Environment is, is mentioned in our work, so interviews that how to educate the people and the, and the waste workers to make them more, more safety in, in the collection and the managing the waste. The second, we found the developing countries particularly need prepare contingency plans because while I mentioned they don't have enough resources and that they have capacities, though, they, but at the same time, they had to look at how they quickly work on to manage this situation with their limited capacities and the resources and changing their waste collection systems and then changing their waste treatment treatment systems. So that need more, more contingency plans to make out. And also we found, especially in developing countries, uh, uh, this situation, so they had to secure uh, life and the livelihood of the informal sector and the waste workers and also the women who mostly involved in this waste management business in, in the developing countries due to the uh, lack of uh, formal waste management systems in the cities and the countries. So that, that is very important aspect. We found very quickly they need to respond because they are the ones who, who, who totally uh, handle the waste management system. In some cities, 100%, these informal people are, are, are managing the waste sector. So uh, how, to, how, to, how to secure their livelihood and the life is very important. But it is not enough that my colleagues Eric mentioned. So we, the cities and the governments had to look at this COVID-19 as not the challenge, as an opportunity to change their system uh, to, to move forward, to recover and redesign. So we found that uh, it's need the uh, mid-term mid that the recovery process where they had to introduce proper supporting schemes for the informal sector to continue their work and also increase their waste collection and the recycling uh, systems. At the same time, we found that it's data management and the, and the collection of the information and, and making more long-term planning uh, perspective during the recovery process. And the redesign, uh, we, we always found that it is very important as mostly uh, moving from this waste management to more resource uh, efficient uh, society. That is the ultimate goal. In, in the waste management system. So it's not that collect and dump in somewhere. It should be more, more designed to the, uh, including uh, waste uh, uh, recovery, reuse, reducing, and, and more sustainable uh, life, lifestyle systems to, to make the waste management. So that is, uh, I found, we found that the need more uh, international coordination and networking at the regional level and then building the, the capacities of the cities and the local national governments uh, based on the evidence-based uh, uh, planning and the monitoring. So I just want to conclude my, my uh, discussion and also the points. What we learned that, as I mentioned, this is a good opportunity for the, for the cities and the, and the national governments to look at their waste management system and then think about long-term improvement in, in the subject. But in, in, in two ways, what we learn, like uh, these uh, three hours, what my Eric, colleague Eric mentioned, like a, uh, ready, uh, like a quickly change to the redesign, they need to think about three very important uh, sectors. What we found like a system change, it is very important how they move in from the current, uh, the collect and dump uh, kind of a waste management system to more sustainable waste management system linking other other development activities 
At the same time, it is not easy they, if they don't have proper institution and the sound institution with the uh, resource, uh, uh, resource availability. At the same time, the people, finally, all this can be happen when we have a very good uh, agents to change, like uh, we starting from the household who can support the system separating garbage at household level and reducing waste generating at the household level to the waste collectors and the transporters and the city staff and the national staff, private sector, all are, should be involved in this process. So uh, improving these uh, three uh, uh, urban environment, we feel that uh, the cities and the national governments can take uh, uh, actions to, to handle this COVID-19 situation and redesign their systems to uh, properly uh, go forward uh, in the uh, post-COVID situations. So thank you very much. If you want more information, please uh, access to our IGS or the CCT website so you can get these reports. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kumara. Hello. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumara, for sharing with us very uh, interesting, but also very important uh, finding uh, regarding how the COVID will impact on the waste sector in uh, many countries, especially in Asia. And uh, very interesting to see how the triple R framework again uh, has been applied in, 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 uh, to address the challenge in the West, uh, West sector uh, to how to respond to the risks of the, from the COVID and how to recover and how to design, redesign the system, the waste management system in order to address uh, the challenge. So with that, uh, may I uh, invite, open, like to open floor for the question from the audience. Uh, for the uh, for the for the presentation from Dr. Kumara, yeah. Is there any uh, question from audience, also from other speaker as well? And actually, uh, just for your information, before you. Um, before you raise the question, uh, actually, Dr. Kumara has a lot of uh, experience uh, working with uh, many uh, national and also local government in Asia, especially in ASEAN, and um, to support uh, many countries to build a kind of, uh, national strategy uh, on uh, solid waste management. And recently, he uh, worked with the government of uh, Myanmar uh, to support the Myanmar government to build, uh, to establish the national strategies uh, on uh, solid waste management. In, in Myanmar. So he have a lot of practical experience. So please feel free to, to ask him any questions on, on, on related to uh, this uh, area. Yeah. Sam? Yeah. Yeah, this is Eric. Can I ask a question to Kamara Sam? Yeah, sure. Hi, Kamara san Thank you so much for your presentation. I probably could just talk to you and I just, but I think it's an important point that I think is probably useful for sharing more broadly. I mean, at the very end, you, you mentioned this, uh, you know, the importance of the redesign. And uh, of course, uh, this is something I also emphasize. I think it also applies to even the waste and water management system. I'm just wondering if, you know, you, you did some really good empirical research. Have, have you seen any evidence or any Efforts so far to redesign systems. I understand we're still going through COVID right now, but do you see any any of the policymakers at national city level actually making efforts in that direction? Uh, thanks, Eric. Yes, uh, we found uh, some cities uh, also uh, not just uh, uh, respond to the situation, so they are taking some uh, initiatives to redesign their waste management systems uh, to the future. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, so what we see this is happening, the cities where uh, the two things I, I feel very important. One is the cities where very strong uh, political uh, leadership is, is available. So then it is easy for them to, uh, what we learned that the, they, they take some kind of a, initiative uh, to, to that uh, direction. At the same time, uh, 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 cities where the, uh, I feel it is kind of a governance systems are working because not only the city, a very strong uh, 
uh, academic or the civil societies uh, are, are available and then they they are sometimes not the city take di directions but that kind of a groups take some leadership and and, and make some uh, efforts to make the city to start something to rethink the the situation so that kind of a, i feel like a top down like a political leadership take a direction and also the bottom up where the 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 other stakeholders take take some kind of a directions to to make uh, that redesign process in the in the cities and the governments yes we can see but not uh, very very everywhere but uh, uh, the some some actions are coming from some cities where we are working thank you okay thank you very much dr kumara uh, is there thanks, any, uh, is there any other question from the audience Actually, I have a, before that, I have a one question uh, for Kumara Sang. Uh, actually, you know, you know that uh, in uh, uh, many uh, developing country, um, uh, many country have to heavily rely on the landfill, which is, which is not often the center, sanitary landfill. Um, and as a result, there's a, there's a lot of uh, potential risks uh, of the infection from, 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 from the, for the solid waste, uh, because in many developing country, sometimes the medical waste, it has been mixed up with the uh, uh, municipal solid waste as well. So the people who, the person who most at risk is uh, the, 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 the worker from um, waste management worker, for example, in Vietnam is a Urenco and so on, Urenco staff. Do, do you have any evidence or any, did you know any report that uh, to show some kind of risk that uh, waste, waste worker has now uh, facing in, in, in ASEAN? Any evidence that um, uh, wet worker has been affected by by the COVID from uh, from uh, from from their work. Uh, actually, uh, Bao, that is one of the, the the discussion within our team also because uh, it's very difficult to uh, 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 have a, some kind of uh, information quickly. But we we found that it is uh, infected uh, to the waste workers. Uh, especially the 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 areas because we are the not the much uh, properly organized by the uh, waste work waste uh, like uh, informal waste workers because in some countries uh, we have very strong uh, informal sector organizations like in India so there are waste workers informal waste workers are well organized and then managing these organizations so they have very good. Uh, uh, information system, education, and the support system to the workers. But the, the others where the, the workers are working without such kind of organization system. So we feel uh, they have infected, but the, the reporting system is very weak in many countries. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you, you know that if something happened to the very famous person, it is quickly reported. But uh, mm -hmm. this kind of a waste workers, uh, it's not much uh, reported. But we are now doing some research to understand how, how it is uh, affected to the, to the waste workers. So that is uh, one of the, the information gap in, in this uh, situation. So yeah. yeah, so that is very important point. So, uh, but uh, we couldn't find uh, some quick data uh, to show that how many number of waste workers were affected. So we cannot find that information yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kubara. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to see that kind of, uh, new fighting from your team. So um, I think we are a little bit behind the schedule. Um, so one again, allow me to say thank you very much, Dr. Kumara, for your excellent uh, presentation and talk today. And um, next, uh, please allow me to invite the uh, next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nguyen Ling Dan. Uh, he's an, uh, she's now a visiting uh, lecturer uh, at, the, at the Faculty of Environmental, Climate Change, and Urban Study uh, at the National Economics University in Vietnam. Uh, so before joining the National uh, Economic University, uh, Dr. Ling Dan already uh, spent many years at the Asia, Asia Pacific Energy Research Center. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a research institute for IPEC uh, Bay in Tokyo. So I believe that um, Dr. Ling Dan has a lot of experience on, on, on in the field of uh, energy and also the climate change. And so today uh, she's gonna explain about, uh, about uh, share with us about how the COVID 
uh, impacts in, uh, on, the, on the economies in Vietnam as well as the progress uh, toward achieving uh, SDG goal uh, in, in Vietnam. So Dr. Ling Dan, floor is yours. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, it's very clear. Okay, yeah. thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, organizer, for inviting me, for giving me a chance to talk today in the very interesting Vanjay conference. Um, I'm going to talk about the COVID pandemic and its impact on environment and SDG in Vietnam uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Tun Pot Dat from the National Economics University. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've just come back as the, the chair has just um, uh, introduced. I've just come back from uh, Japan after 11 years of uh, uh, staying in Japan, uh, staying and uh, learning, studying, working. And um, my last four years in Japan, I've been co uh, I've been working at the national. I'm sorry, at the Asia Pacific um, Energy Research Center in Tokyo. And um, some of the slides in this presentation, I will use the, my uh, research results from uh, uh, what I have done in the APERC. So um, let me begin my presentation by, uh, let me check if it can run smoothly. Okay, so my presentation, I will talk about two things. The first thing is about the COVID-19, the war in Vietnam. And the next uh, topic is about the, how Vietnam uh, develop the economics after COVID-19. So um, I believe that in our session, there, will, uh, there have been many people talking about um, how coronavirus has spread it. Uh, I just uh, want to um, show this slide that I've just got it from the World Health Organization um, a few days ago, saying that the spread of the COVID is very serious and it doesn't have the sign to cool down. So if you can see the number of people totally have been infected by the virus uh, have been up to 43 million cases all over the world and over 1 million people have been died from it. Uh, and especially America, America's there are around more than 25 million people um, have been confirmed. And uh, Southeast Asia, which include Vietnam, um, is, not the, is, is not the exception. Um, so in order to tackle with this um, serious uh, pandemic, there are many measures and one of the measures is the social distancing. It has been proven to be very effective to uh, flatten the curve of infections. Um, maybe I don't need to explain about the definition of social distancing because um, we are all experienced this social distancing. Because of social distancing, we have to change from the um, in-person meeting to this kind of conference meeting. And uh, this is a very new experience that all of us have been try our best to uh, adapt ourselves to. Uh, there are many um, advices during social distancing. For example, we should uh, clean our hands very often. We should use soap. Uh, we should wear a mask and we don't, sh shouldn't touch our faces, um, etc. Uh, and um, the most uh, term, the most popular term that we have heard of is like stay home, right? And um, I believe that everybody who is living in uh, Tokyo is familiar with the term stay home. Uh, so uh, what should we do during the stay home time? Uh, from a paper of uh, John Hopkins uh, University. Uh, they have listed several practice of uh, social distancing, which include um, so schools and colleges and university. They try to change in-person lessons to remote lessons. And um, the cities cancel all the events, including sports, sports festivals, parades, um, companies trying to promote more flexible work options like uh, telecommuting or um, teleconferences. Um, organizations and businesses uh, cancel large gatherings and um, even the house of worship, they suspend their services. And one of my friends, she um, used to go to the church do, um, in every Sunday. And uh, recently she has to change to like uh, worship activities through the online system. And uh, church is also very uh, church is also very fast in adopting this kind of practice of social distancing. Um, 
So what is the result of this social distancing during COVID-19? Um, as all of us can, um, can, can expect, the, during the social distancing, the travel demand drops significantly. And we see a lot of changes in travel, not only travel demand, but also the travel mode. People change from um, public, but people reduce their public use of, um, um, of transport, especially during peak hour. Um, they try to uh, shift their work from the peak hour to the less less peak hours and um, less car traffic as well because many people do not have to go to work uh, and also people try to um, ordering food to home instead of instead of going out so um, for example restaurants cafe uh, coffee shop etc they don't have uh, a lot they reduce a lot of their customers um, and uh, in general the consumptions the social consumption reduces a lot um, industrial activities also slow down if you can remember in the beginning of this year many industrial parks have to close because uh, of uh, the fear of um, spreading the coronavirus while people don't have any information about this very strange and new uh, type of virus um, so, you know, we know that the impact of uh, coronavirus to our um, economy and also our social uh, system is very heavy. However, there is a little bit of bright side if uh, regards to the environmental effects. Uh, cutting a paper to, from uh, Rim and Islam in um, early this year, uh, so, sorry, I think May this year, they say that especially for the environment there are both negative impacts and positive impacts so um, uh, e economy and social they almost have negative impact but for environment negative impact uh, almost light on the uh, the waste management for example there are a lot of medical waste which include hazardous waste as well so there will be a challenge for the environment and also when people trying to prevent themselves from being um, transmitted by the virus, they try to throw away things uh, more quickly, uh, such as mask, or um, they try to reduce the reuse of things as we used to be, or even recycle is less than before. Um, however, there are a lot of positive impacts to the environment. For example, the as I've just has mentioned, the transport has been reduced uh, and also the consumption of the resources um, and the waste disposal in, in, the, in general is also um, lower than usual. Um, emissions from transport, industry and uh, power is um, also reduced due to the less act, less this due to less activities and the tourist destination um, have uh, less uh, pressure because there's less uh, tourist coming to the um, the place as before uh, yeah so that's why we uh, recently we can experience the um, air quality improving, uh, especially in the urban area, such as Hanoi city or Ho Chi Minh city. Um, so that's the general information um, in uh, the world and how the COVID um, situation and how the COVID affect Vietnam. And let's have a look at the, uh, at the, at the figure on your left-hand side, also my, my left-hand side as well. Uh, this uh, figure, I took from the Ministry of Health in Vietnam. So this is just before the second wave of coronavirus in July in 2020. So um, as you can see, the infected cases is only like uh, up to 400 cases and there's no death at all. Um, and looking at your um, left-hand side, the figure in your left-hand side, which I have just taken um, a day, a day ago, uh, the confirmed cases in Vietnam after the second wave of the coronavirus is now up, is now only 1,300 people, and um, the number of death. Let me let me sh move the screen. The number of death is just um, 35 people. Uh, 35 people um, is a lot, but if you compare to other other 
uh, data of other countries, it is very, very minor. For example, in Japan, um, as far as I concern, there is around uh, 140, 140,000 people of, uh, infected by the virus and uh, almost 2,000 people die from uh, this disease. Um, not to mention America with uh, all Americas, uh, with uh, up to 25 million people infected. So uh, this is to say that the cases, the number of cases, both cases and death in Vietnam is uh, very limited. Uh, so what I can conclude it from this is that um, I have, I can uh, do the two conclusion. The first one is that the COVID doesn't really affect Vietnam very seriously if compared to other com countries in the world. And also the Vietnam's response to the COVID has shown to be very swift, very sharp and very effective. And we already, uh, we, we should say that successfully control the outbreak and move it back to its tracks. Um, talking a little bit about the economic growth um, because the COVID-19 uh, doesn't really do a very heavy, um, heavy burden to the economy. So, uh, although we experience around like one or two percent of GDP growth in this year to 2020, but many international organization, uh, even the Vietnamese government, also project that we are going to experience, uh, we are going to return to our economic growth pathway in 2021 ahead. Um, if you can see from this uh, curve, the curve before 2020, Vietnam has been experienced very high growth and one of the highest growth in uh, Southeast Asia and also in Asia region, uh, up to 6.8 or 7% per year. And we are going to go back on track or even higher uh, according to, for example, ADB, ADB, um, I think I think this is not uh, their last number, but um, one of their temporary number for 2021 is like 8.2. It's like amazingly high. And also for, um, let me show, 6.5 uh, is our government target. Um, even for uh, IMF, IMF in your uh, brown, uh, in the brown um, line, in the brown line, they project us to be like 7% next year. So this is to say that um, COVID-19, although have a very heavy uh, burden to the economy in 2020, but it's going, um, the economy is going to return to its track uh, from next year. Um, and uh, some, just some of the conclusion from Bloomberg, they say that among the Southeast Asian countries, only Vietnam will witness a positive economic growth this year, uh, showing that the Vietnam's effort in tackling with COVID is, is uh, very significant. And on the 2021 economic outlook, Vietnam's economy will outgrowth other um, Southeast Asia countries. Um, okay, so uh, the second story I want to share with you is um, how Vietnam will recover and uh, how we will continue with um, developing the SDG after COVID-19. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, SDG. I believe that uh, this topic has already been covered in our previous talks. And um, we already know that there is 17 um, sustainable development goals, which have been uh, developed from the millenn uh, millennium uh, goals. Um, this uh, 17 goals is uh, more inclusive and more uh, um, practical to our current situation. And if we can count from these 17 uh, goals, there are at least seven, um, eight goals that is related to the environment, uh, showing that the environment, um, showing that we have to pay at least half of our effort to improve our environment in order to, um, uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. For example, uh, goals number three is about good health and well-being. Uh, good, he good health uh, cannot be achieved if we don't have a good environment lead. And um, number six is clean water and sanitation. 
uh, number 7, 11, and uh, 12, especially, um, uh, especially uh, deal with the energy consumption um, uh, to require, we, have, we need to use energy more, uh, uh, to use energy cleaner, more, afford, more affordable and more sustainable. Uh, so that's about SDG. And um, this slide is to show the importance of the environment to our life, which is also taken from the World Health Organization. Uh, environment impacts our life and our health in many ways. Uh, for example, in climate change, in agricultural practices, in um, radiation, it gives us the radiation uh, to uh, maintain our lives, our green lives, and also recently the renewables energy. And it also um, affect us, uh, it also gives us a very clean air or um, on the other hand, it can also uh, it provide us with a very bad air if we don't really protect it. So, uh, especially in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, there are many reasons that uh, cause the environmental degra degradation in Vietnam. Uh, and many of them uh, are because of the energy using. Uh, for example, energy usage uh, directly related to at least four aspects of life, uh, transport, uh, building, uh, industry, power, and um, also uh, other fields, for example, agriculture uh, and uh, uh, other household activities, uh, urban planning and waste management waste management, etc. Environmental issues in Vietnam also um, are highlighted by the deforestation. Um, deforestation uh, caused a lot of uh, recent um, disaster that you um, must have already heard of. For example, the um, flood recently flood in Vietnam in the central of Vietnam this year. Uh, and uh, many, many of the um, consequences that we have been experienced from the degra degradation is because of our long-term uh, economic growth and our, um, and our pathway of economic, not only because of the temporary effect. Uh, so um, yes, as I have just uh, concluded from these causes, uh, they need more long -ter longer term interventions than the short term or temporary impacts of the pandemic. So in the previous slide, I um, have uh, mentioned that the COVID-19 have uh, temporary uh, impact to the environment. That is very um, that is very positive. However, um, if we want to tackle with environmental issues in Vietnam, we cannot rely on that kind of short term and we cannot be um, very optimistic about this short term uh, improvement uh, in uh, 2020 that we already see in our pre in the previous few months. Um, this slide I took from a research from um, uh, Professor Chen Thodat and his colleagues. Um, about the forecast of Vietnam economy to 2045 uh, compared to um, Korea, China, Malaysia, and the three scenario of a Vietnam economy. Um, the three, the, the most, uh, the three highest uh, line uh, represent um, respectively Korea, Malaysia, and China. And in our most um, optimistic scenario, Vietnam will uh, reach to the same level of the three countries in 2045 uh, with around 70,000 uh, 70, uh, dollars of a GDP per capita. So um, not only uh, international organization, but also in Vietnam, especially our um, government has put a very high target for the economy growth in the future. Um, however, uh, if you um, ever heard of the power shortage in Vietnam, or you, if, if you ever experienced the uh, power uh, electricity price increase in Vietnam, for example, the things is, which is very um, near our um, to our daily life, um, 
you will know that we have serious problems related to energy uses, usage. Um, economic growth is always coupled with the energy use. So in order to promote the economic, we need to use enough energy to um, uh, ensure the growth of the economy in the future and also to um, support the uh, expansion of the population. So the Asia Pacific Energy Research Center in 2019 has just made a um, projection of uh, energy use for all um, APEC economies, including Vietnam. Uh, and uh, this is the projection of Vietnam to uh, 2050. Uh, uh, as you can see from the figure on your left, uh, the energy use keep increasing very sharply. And in 2050, the total demand of energy use usage almost double the level in um, 2016. And one of the most rapidly uh, increase in the demand is transport. And then um, industry will still be the key, uh, the key sector that will use energy in the future. Energy here, um, if you can see your left hand figure, energy here in which is include uh, electricity, renewables, gas, oil, and coal. And the color, the, the yellow color, and also, um, I'm sorry, this is like orange color and the black color represent oil and coal, which is fossil fuel, um, is almost like three, fifth of the energy usage in 2050. So from this kind of uh, image, you can, you can imagine that in the future, we will use a lot of oil in order to satisfy our transport demand and a lot of coal in order to satisfy our industry demand with our current technology. Um, there are, you know, APER also developed several different um, scenario to, in, to reduce the emission of uh, the carbon dioxide. Uh, for example, the TGT and the 2DC, uh, which is uh, like less emission using more renewable and um, using less um, coal and oil. So um, by sector, if we trying to, you know, to relieve the burden to the environment, we will we can reach the total final demand in 2050 to 88 mTO. 88 mTO is equivalent to like 1.5 or 1.2 of the 2016 level. Uh, and ju just to mention that the, in the BAU that I have just uh, show you in the figure, the in your figure it's the, in the left the BAU will double um, the energy energy amount, but in the 2DC, it will also, it will only increase like 1.3 to 1.5 uh, tons. And by fuels, uh, the most significantly uh, improve, improve is in the renewables. In the renewables, uh, as you can see, the uh, MTO, the percentage, the share, the share of, although the absolute number of renewables almost stay the same, but the share of renewables will increase a lot if we try to reduce our emission as much as possible. Um, this slide is to compare the emission between the three uh, scenarios and also to compare with the NDC. The NDC of Vietnam is the national mean uh, contribution of Vietnam. Uh, because Vietnam joined the Paris Agreement, so um, we developed the, the intended uh, national uh, determined contributions, the INDC, and now we confirm with the NDC. The NDC, oh, in this figure, we used the NDC in uh, 2016, uh, but currently we are revising and we have just, um, I think we have just published the new NDC number, which um, uh, include a higher uh, target of emission. But compared to the NDC in 2016, that we target to reduce around 8% to 25% uh, to of emission in 2030. 
uh, we believe that if we uh, continue to uh, control the, our, uh, our growth, continue to replace our energy system with renewables, and also um, to take care about the transport system, to change the mode of uh, transport into a more uh, an, um, efficient use of fuel, we will um, successfully uh, reach our NDC target. Um, to conclude my presentation, I would like to, to um, say some key takeaways. So um, in this presentation, we talk about the impact of uh, COVID and also uh, not only to the environment, but also to SDG in general. Um, so I should say that in the long term, uh, not uh, for Vietnam specifically, not only the contemporary pandemic, but the economic growth model would have a greater influence on the implementation of the SDG uh, in Vietnam because the impact of uh, COVID is not that serious. So we need to pay more attention to the economic growth than the, um, uh, co the COVID impact uh, itself. And uh, the second takeaway is that if the economy continue to grow as business as usual, so the current positive effect of COVID on the environment, for example, improving the air quality, um, improving the, uh, um, the waste management, for example, and that positive effect will not last long. So we need to consider this uh, current, this temporary impact and to continue to improve it or to maintain it in the future. And also it's the high time for the government to reconsider the primary sources of pollution, such as transport or energy related activities, and to take advantage of the short term contraction through stage of, to develop a more sustainable pathway for the economy. The contraction uh, through stage is uh, shown in the figure that I have just shown you a few slides ago slides ago is like going up and going down so we can consider, see we consider it's as the contracts contraction stage um, but we shouldn't like if we continue that kind of stage uh, and we continue to our our uh, previous normal that would that would have nothing to say uh, or that would have nothing to to um, be improved for our sustainability but we need to reconsider it and to change our uh, economy model in order to um, head for a more sustainable pathway of uh, the economy. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ling Dan, for a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation, giving us a very uh, good picture of a few pictures on how the COVID uh, impacts uh, in Vietnam. Uh, not only on the economics aspect, but also on various uh, areas like energies and environment and so on. Um, so I believe there's uh, many, many questions from the audience, uh, but uh, unfortunately, because of the, uh, our session a little bit um, behind the schedule, so we need to spend uh, time for other sessions. So then allow me to accept uh, one or two questions from the audience. So I received one question from the audience uh, regarding to your presentations on the, on the prediction of the GDP uh, uh, in 2021. You said that 8.1%. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. But uh, the question is, um, let us assume that the, the whole world succeed in uh, addressing the COVID-19. And what are the factors which enable Vietnam to grow that, that much? And which is much uh, larger than the pre uh, than before the corona, like six point five percent. What what could be the factor? Yeah. Yeah, that will be a very interesting um, question. Uh, the reason why I show many uh, projections, not only from um, Bloomberg, but also from um, World Bank, ADB, IMF, etc., because many uh, they have a different point of view and they have different assumptions in projecting the GDP. So um, I guess that, uh, and even our government only put the target of 6.5. Uh, but for the, for example, Bloomberg, they um, project uh, like 8 point, 8 point, uh, sorry, like, yeah, 8.1 percent. I think that they um, put a very high expectation into Vietnam economy, including the transition of many factories from China to Vietnam 
and the recover of the economy, which shows a very stable politics and which um, politics and um, uh, uh, economic growth, uh, very very stable and very um, uh, what should I say a very uh, reliable medical system. Um, if other countries uh, continue to be you know, highly affected by the COVID. And, and that's true because at the same time, uh, with this projection for Vietnam, the projection for other countries is very low. Like I've just mentioned, the S, um, Vietnam is only one country in the region who can experience the positive growth. So uh, assuming that kind of uh, difference in economic, uh, in, in uh, recovery um, capability, uh, we have higher chance to get uh, more uh, number of uh, tourists and we can have higher chance to recover our economy system, including tourism, including industrial, because we successfully um, uh, can attract the factories moving from China, for example. And uh, such kind of factors, I think, can contribute a lot to this kind of growth, according to the assumptions of uh, Bloomberg, for example. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice response. Um, Let's one more question. Um, mm. You know that uh, in Vietnam, we are quite succeed in uh, stopping the spread of the COVID effect to the community. Um, mm. I think many countries want to learn from that, uh, even Japan. So, so nowadays, uh, every day we receive like more than 2000 case, a new case. So, so uh, what could be, according to your opinion, what could be the succeed factor that help the country to, to completely stop the, the, the impact or the spread of the COVID? Uh, like, like, like what we can achieve nowadays here? Yeah. Um, I think uh, there would be like two main factors. There, uh, there must be many factors that help Vietnam to tackle with this uh, pandemic very quickly. But I think there will be two main factors. The, the first one is the top-down uh, measures. The top-down measures of Vietnam is uh, very effective, very sharp, very swift. And uh, because we used to be we are always the top-down economy, so it's very easy to um, do any kind to implement any kind of regulations, especially in doing quarantine. And also, the second reason is like the um, bottom-up measures. So we have been building a very effective social system uh, with the help of uh, social media, uh, and we have uh, like small social. Uh, division which can control each other like a small community so um, we I think um, because of the of the desire or of the willing of both the government and the the people in general uh, we can together tackling with this uh, this COVID and uh, if I can say a very um, a very like informal reason for this kind of success it like it should be the personal uh, information in Vietnam which is not uh, being protected very very um, yeah, very carefully as in other countries so it's very easy to define to detect the the F1 or F2 or F0 uh, so that's it I think it's also a very informal reason that can uh, help um, uh, tackling with this kind of pandemic yeah, I think, thank you very much. It's very interesting to, to hear from, from that. I hope you can prepare some paper to, to share with the international communities about this uh, lesson. Um, so I think uh, that's all from uh, our sessions. Um, one again, uh, on behalf of uh, organizing committee, uh, I would like to express my uh, sincere thanks to all the speakers for your excellent um, presentation and talk today. And also like to uh, say thank you very much for all the uh, participants for your very patient to, to join our session, although it's already <laughs> behind the schedule, I, I think more than 30 minutes. So uh, one again, I hope that um, this um, session will give a, a audience and participants a lot of um, uh, a much better understanding how the COVID is impact, uh, effect to our society, especially on the, on the global progress toward achieving the SDG, uh, not only at the global scale, but also in, in, in case of Vietnam as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude the session. Uh, and one again, thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.